Welcome to Convict Sydney, New South Wales in the 1790s. Think of this as a pretty cruel and hopeless place, a dumping ground for the prisoners from Britain's overcrowded jails, where people were miserable most of the time. But that's not the whole story. New South Wales became a radical experiment in giving rogues, thieves and adventurers a chance. In 1790, the second fleet of English ships ever to go to the colony is on its way. On board are Lieutenant John MacArthur, his wife Elizabeth and their baby son. They're on their way to begin a new life. These are two very ambitious people. In my last letter, I informed you, my dear mother, of my husband's exchange to a corps destined for the convict settlement at New South Wales, from which we have every reasonable expectation of reaping the most material advantage. MacArthur and Elizabeth have had to fight to get this far in life. They demand more space and privacy, as befits their status. But then the second fleet is the voyage from hell. It is run by private contractors who normally work the slave trade. They're paid whether the convicts on board, who are the main reason for the colony existing at all, arrive dead or alive. A quarter die on the voyage. It does nothing to sway the MacArthur's. They are seeking their fortune at the farthest corner of the empire, and God pity any man who gets in MacArthur's way. The Sydney town that awaits them has also been doing it tough. A tiny population of a thousand people nearly starved waiting for the second fleet. The MacArthur's arrive to a raw young community just over two years old, made up mostly of convicts. If the colony is ever to be more than a jail dependent on supplies from Britain, it needs free settlers like the MacArthur's to make it self-sufficient. In the meantime, Lieutenant MacArthur has come to join these men the soldiers of the New South Wales Corps, the troops sent to protect the colony. And he couldn't have timed it better. The Corps will soon be left in charge when the colony's founding governor is recalled to England. In the years that follow, MacArthur and his fellow officers seize the opportunity left by the official vacuum to make their fortunes. As a member of the Corps, MacArthur is entitled to a hundred acres of farmland with convicts free of charge to work it. Before he's finished, he and Elizabeth will have a great deal more. Their farm and those of the other Corps members now deliver the produce needed to make the colony self-sufficient, a huge step forward in giving the colony a future. Gradually, the other smaller settlers, many of them ex-convicts, catch up as well. New South Wales is becoming more of a farming community than a jail for old lags. But all the farming land has to come from where? The short answer is from the Aborigines. As the white settlers take up more land across the 1790s, the Aborigines fight back. No one's asked them. The land is simply taken. By contrast, MacArthur has good relations with the local Durag people. Through careful negotiations, he avoids the violence and the troubles affecting other farmers. But MacArthur is anything but diplomatic with this man. In 1800, Governor Philip Gidley King arrives to find a colony spiralling out of control. 
Despite the progress made with farming, the colony is awash with hard liquor. Over the last 10 years, the Corps have made a fortune importing rum. They purchase an incredible 7,500 gallons of the stuff and sell it on at great profit. The Rum Corps, as they will become known, even use spirits as a form of currency. Scenes of drunken and licentious behaviour become the norm. King is appalled and determined to assert control. He outlaws the officers' trade in rum and encourages other forms of pay. King's fight with the Rum Corps brings him into direct confrontation with John MacArthur. King shows his colours when he calls the Rum Corps hucksters and sides with the small settlers who owe them money. Well, MacArthur is livid. He and his fellow officers will not be told off by some jumped-up governor, especially one from the Navy. And he announces that the officers will boycott the government house. And that leads to this. MacArthur challenging his own commanding officer, Colonel Patterson, to a duel. Patterson's crime, telling MacArthur to show the governor some respect. You will rot on Norfolk Island for this. Damn you, sir. I'm no serf. You've treated me with the blackest treachery. I demand a court-martial in London, point of honour. Oh, for heaven's sake. Excellent. You're bound for London forthwith. MacArthur is sent to England, but the court-martial collapses after all the paperwork is rather conveniently lost at sea. And he deftly brings the matter to a close by resigning from the army. But London is a big, fat opportunity for MacArthur, and he makes the most of it. Far from slinking around the streets in disgrace, he lobbies the government to support a scheme to make the Australian colony a major wool producer. He wants land, and plenty of it. MacArthur. Banks. Sir Joseph Banks. Yeah. But it almost comes unstuck when he meets one of white Australia's founding fathers. Their talk will be the first small step to the Rum Rebellion. I was surprised to see you didn't bid for the Cheviot Rat. No, no, I like a sheep with wool on its face. You have a hard sun in Australia, as you well know. Indeed I do. I assume your intention is to take your purchases back to Australia immediately. Mm -hmm. and if that is the case, you may well be unaware there is an Act of Parliament that forbids the exportation of English live sheep from these shores. Never heard of such a thing. But I'd be prepared to help you around this travail. And why would you want to do that? I'm interested to see the colony prosper. Well, there's only one thing I'm interested in seeing prosper, and I can do it without your help. Perhaps you're right. The Cheviot isn't suitable for New South Wales. I do hope, however, that the people of the colony share one of its qualities. Oh, yes. There's no fear of the wool being pulled over its eyes. I bid you good day, sir. Mm. He can't help himself, can he, MacArthur? Next stop, the corridors of power, and no less a personage than the Secretary of State for the colonies. Your encounter with Sir Joseph is the talk of Whitehall. I have no idea why, it was just a few words. He's campaigning against the size of your grant. Words cost too dearly, my friend. He's determined to see the size of your land grant reduced. I asked for his help several years ago and was refused. Now, without explanation or forewarning, he approaches me in a public place. The man is a buffoon. Really? I can't see how my affairs are anything to do with him. And then you'll be none the wiser when things don't turn out the way you plan. Sir Joseph regards the Antipodes as his domain, you see. People take his views very seriously. They seek out his advice and, dare I say it, usually take it. Yeah. Impertinent. Good Lord, the old boar was in the country 30 years ago. It was all kangaroos and savages. Indeed. However, 
He says my land grant to you of 10,000 acres seems overly generous. There are many who agree with him. They say you fellows control too much already. Give the small settlers and ex-convicts a chance. That sort of thing. But it is done. Oh, yes, yes. In time, it will be done. For the moment, would you object to taking 5,000 acres at first? On the understanding that you will receive the other 5,000 acres on completion of your undertaking? If that is the way it has to be, Lord Camden, that is the way it has to be. Back in Sydney, poor old Governor King can't believe it. He sent MacArthur to London in disgrace for a court-martial and the rogue comes back with a land grant for 5,000 acres. King returns to England a bitter and disappointed man. To add insult to injury, Lord Camden even gave MacArthur some prized merino sheep from no less a source than the royal flocks. He claims the colony's best grazing land. Known as the cow pastures, it had been protected by previous governors for the use of cattle that might feed the colony in times of need. But MacArthur ignores protests and takes the pastures for himself. In 1806, Governor William Bly set sail for New South Wales, a man who will turn the colony on its head and change its destiny forever. The Captain Bly of the infamous Mutiny on the Bounty. Bly is an officer of great ability but terrible temper, a commander who has turned loyal men into rebels. Accompanied by his daughter Mary Putland, Bly is on a mission to sort out a troublesome colony. An appointment encouraged by no less than MacArthur's old adversary, Sir Joseph Banks. When Bly arrives in New South Wales, the settler population is up to about 7,000 people. Only one-fifth the convicts under sentence, the rest a rabble of military, free settlers and ex-convicts. Bly sees Sydney as a physical and administrative mess. He believes that he is the very man to knock it and the rum corps into shape. You're smiling, Papa. Because, madam, a group of uppity ex-convicts and unruly officers about to learn a lesson. Bly sets to work immediately. He tries to end the rum economy by prohibiting the use of spirits as barter. But the real battle is about land. Mrs. Putland. Mr. MacArthur. I hope I'm not disturbing you, Governor. I understand there's been some talk about the land granted to be my Lord Camden. Now, I was originally offered 10,000 acres, half of which I've accepted, and with it have been doing my utmost to create wealth for this colony. The area is called the Cow Pastures, for good reason, sir. A herd of wild cattle established itself there, and Governor King didn't want them driven off. Yes, well, I had this out with the governor before he left. My boundaries have been decided. It would not be good practice to disturb the sheep. sheep what disturb... have I to do with your sheep, sir? What have I to do with your cattle? Are you to have such flocks of sheep and herds of cattle as no man ever heard of before? No, sir, I know your concerns, sir. You've got 5,000 acres of land, sir, in the finest situation in the country, but by God, you shan't keep it. But I remind you, sir, that land was granted to me by recommendation of the Privy Council by order of the Duke of Portland. Damn the Secretary of State. He commands at home. I command here. Well, it would not be my choice to seek redress through the law. However... Damn the law! My will is the law. And it's here that our story of the Rum Rebellion takes a turn. Now, MacArthur is the owner of a ship called the Parramatta, and it's about to get him into trouble. The colony has a law that says that any ship owner who allows a convict to escape forfeits a bond of £800. Now, this is a whopping amount of money. And a convict has escaped while the Parramatta was in Tahiti. When it sails back into Sydney, 
MacArthur wriggles out of trouble by renouncing his share in the vessel, leaving the captain and his crew destitute. When the captain comes to Bly looking for help, it's clear he's come to the wrong man. Governor, sir, my name's uh, Captain John Glenn. I'm skipper of the Paramount. I know who you are, you scum. Well, I've been a week out in the cove, hope too, with uh, no provisions. What does that matter to me? You took a prisoner from here and released him, God knows where. I never, sir. It was all done behind me back. Now, Mr. MacArthur's designed us, and we're all sitting out there rotten with now to. Take your medicine, you scurvy swine. Now, get your useless carcass out of my sight. Bly and his team have hooked their fish. The judge advocate, Richard Atkins, issues a summons, accusing MacArthur of abandoning his crew, forcing them to come ashore illegally. And when MacArthur fails to respond, Atkins issues a warrant for MacArthur's arrest. John MacArthur? Yeah, well, you know who I am, Mr. Oakes. I have a warrant for your arrest. inform the persons who have sent you with this warrant, which I now have a copy of, that I will never submit to the tyranny attempted until I am forced. I treat this with loathing and contempt, as I do the persons who have directed it to be executed. Do you understand that? You tell them that this warrant can only be meant as an insult to me. Now, they will probably be angry with you for disappointing their expectations, but you may tell them in your excuse that I am a sort of gentleman you do not much like to force into anything, and that if they send you with another warrant, they should provide you with an armed force, because I looked in a desperate ill humor. The next day on the road to Sydney, Oakes is waylaid by MacArthur's 18-year-old son, Edward, sent by his mother to relieve the chief constable of a damning note. Oakes refuses to hand it over. It's evidence of sedition and ripe for court. Meanwhile, Bly is tearing down people's houses. Some of the soldiers and other settlers have built houses in the centre of the town, which was supposed to be kept for public space. Previous governors have turned a blind eye, but not Bly, and he doesn't care whom he fights. Now, Bly is determined to remodel parts of the town, especially the area around Government House. He literally sends in the heavy brigade, chucks people out and pulls the houses down, all in the name of the public good. But Bly does have supporters. Many of the smaller settlers living in the Hawkesbury River area north of Sydney are more than happy to see the Corps and their friends brought down a peg or two. Helping to make the colony a fairer place has been one of Bly's main objectives. Do you hold this, please? I've broken the officer's monopoly on rum. I've stood up to their greed for land and I do believe the people acknowledge that, Mary. They convicts. They do as they are told. Indeed. But one day these lands will be covered with farms where ordinary folk can prosper. Damn MacArthur. Bly is right. The colony is fast leaving its convict origins behind, but his sea captain's dream of hamlets and hedgerows and honest, simple folk is a fantasy. In the Industrial Revolution, the giant mills of England are hungry for wool, delivered by the shipload. MacArthur knows that the future belongs to men of property like him. The next fight will be about a fence. Bly is resuming land in Sydney town, he says was wrongly allocated to settlers by previous governors. MacArthur's section is fenced in, but not for long. Have you come to take my fence down, have you? I have, sir, by order of the governor. Well, as you can see, it's, uh, it's hardly in good condition. My instructions are, should any rail be fixed, it will be my duty to take them down. 
that is what I will do, sir. By order of the governor. Precisely what I will do, sir! When the axe is laid to the root, the tree will fall. But MacArthur has no intention of falling anywhere. He's seen governors come and go. And he knows back in Britain there are rumblings about how much power a governor should have anyway. In England, one of the most powerful advocates of democracy is Jeremy Bentham. And he's in no doubt that the governors of New South Wales are a pack of despots. The governor issues a proclamation. Whoever defies me, I will punish. And how shall this miscreant be tried? Why, by a court appointed by the governor himself. This is not law. This is the basest act of despotism. It's thoughts like these that move men to rebellion. But Major George Johnston, the commander of the New South Wales Corps, has no stomach for mutiny. Talking about trees. I was there when Bly's henchmen took to poor Whittle's house and tore it to pieces. Tore it down in front of his crying wife and children. Yes, I heard. Men were obeying orders doing their duty. And the man's a martinet, failed Navy man. Bounty for heaven's sake. He has treated the army with nothing but contempt. The men are ready to tear him to pieces. You were talking about treason? No. No, I'm talking about honor. We may have started out a penal colony, but by God, I will not be a prisoner to this man. On the 25th of January, 1808, MacArthur appears in the criminal court on charges of sedition over the Parramatta ship incident and of resisting arrest. On the bench are six officers of the New South Wales Corps and the judge advocate, Richard Atkins. The officers act as magistrates hearing the case. What follows is a shambles, orchestrated by John MacArthur. I propose to read the indictment against John MacArthur, Esquire. Would the defendant please rise? I stand only to object most strenuously to the presence of you, sir, sitting in judgment of me. Mr MacArthur, would you please be quiet and allow me to read the indictment against you? No, sir, I will not. You will, sir. Sit down and shut up. I propose that Judge Advocate shut up and let Mr. MacArthur vent his mind without interruption. Gentlemen, I don't deserve to stand before you here today. Indeed, no man deserves to be treated as I have been treated. I stand here a victim of vicious and cruel designs by men of evil mind and deed. Despite my pleadings, I've still not been able to read the charges laid against me. They've only just been drawn up. Yes, precisely. Concocted at the eleventh hour by the convict George Crossley, aided by this poltroon, the judge advocate, who, having uh, accused me, now presumes to, to sit in judgment of me. Yeah. Now, look, of course, the judge advocate has long acted both as my judge and my prosecutor. And it goes without saying that he is very interested in obtaining a verdict against me. What's he talking about? Some time ago, MacArthur bought a promissory note off another settler, an IOU signed by Atkins, and he's kept it all this time for just this eventuality. Which I am prepared to pay. But you, sir, are demanding interest. This court is now adjourned. This man is indebted to me, and yet, despite my entreaties, refuses to honour a promissory note held in my favour! Now MacArthur takes the stage, and in a masterful piece of political spin, denounces Bly's autocratic rule. You have the eyes of an anxious public upon you. Trembling for the safety of their property, of their 
liberty of their lives. To you has fallen the lot of deciding a point which perhaps involves the happiness or misery of millions. Millions? New South Wales has only 7,000 white people in it. But it sounds good. It is the officers of the New South Wales Corps to whom the administration of justice is committed. And who, that is just, has anything to dread. The magistrate sent a message to Governor Bly demanding that he find a replacement for Atkins or they will appoint someone themselves. In the space of a morning, MacArthur has reduced the colony's court system to a farce. New South Wales is on its way to a military rebellion. They said the most foul things about you, sir, and they didn't spare me either. Damn their eyes! They wouldn't let me speak. And they refused to deliver up my court papers. How did they get them? I left them behind. You're a bloody fool, man! MacArthur and his cronies will do nothing without hatching a plot first. It's an outrage. Surely they wouldn't dream of such a thing. Oh, they would dream of a governor. They would dream it wide awake while talking to your face. We'll start with the magistrates. I'll dismiss them. Every officer on that bench, I'll throw them in irons. We'll see how they judge that. While the rebel magistrates wait for an answer from Governor Bly, he calls on the military commander, Major George Johnston, to intervene. But there appears to have been a slight accident. What does he damn all mean? He's unable to see, sir. He said it would endanger his life. Did he explain in a note? He has injuries. His leg, I think. Oh, he writes with his foot, does he? Well, he does look bruised, sir. He fell out of his carriage going home last night. What? He was on his way home from the cause mess dinner and he seems to have taken a tumble. What? Classic case of drink driving or maybe just a very convenient excuse. He fell out of his gig, sir. What in blazes am I to do? My corps commander is making me pay for enjoying himself too much. Do you think I should suffer such damnable insolence? He seems most determined not to see you, Excellency. Bly just doesn't get it. Johnson's absence is ominous. Within 24 hours of MacArthur's trial collapsing, this tiny community has been pushed to the brink of a military coup. Bly now charges the rebel magistrates, officers under Johnston's own command, with treason, a crime punishable by death. The governor is now set on a collision course with the New South Wales Corps, with the numbers stacked massively against him. Johnston is determined to regain control of the 800 very angry men under his command. Bly inflames the situation by arresting MacArthur and locking him in jail. Events come to a head around 5 p.m. on the 26th of January, 1808, an anniversary we now celebrate as Australia Day. Johnston meets the rebel magistrates. He's made his decision. Hold your tongues! Gentlemen, we have to block his path to the Hawkesbury. The Corps are in a fury. Yet again, while Captain Bly has impugned the honour of the army and the men are talking mutiny. We're together in this. <laughs> Bly himself may try to mobilise his own supporters among the small settlers out on the Hawkesbury. In defiance of Bly, Johnston releases MacArthur from prison and takes control of the rebellion, which is rapidly unfolding. Gather your men, form ranks. And fix bayonets. Yes, sir. Check your fire locks. Shoulder, fire locks. At the ordinary time, march. In the space of just one and a half hours, Johnston, MacArthur, and the Corps have made the momentous decision to march on Government House and place Bly under arrest. Government House is taken by surprise. Well, you get the horses ready. Down upstairs, help me with my uniform.
It is only 700 metres from the main military barracks to Government House. Bly has no time to escape. Governor Bly, sir. The main guard is out and priming and loading. Keep yourself cool, Whaley. Go and observe what's going forward. Yes, sir. Well, it appears, Robert, that Major Johnston seems to decide we're not doing a good enough job. But whatever he might think, Governor, he deserves to swing at the end of a rope for his impudence alone. To buy time for her father, Mary takes matters into her own hands. Stand aside, girl! Go on and get yourself hurt! Stand aside! Get up! Stand up! Get up! Robert, would you be so kind as to go and take care of the ladies? Get downstairs. Try and delay them as long as you can. I think you better let them in, Dunn. They'll only do your mischief and drive a play and that's where your glass if you don't. Oh, no! Stand aside! Where is Governor Bly? Shut the room! Stand aside! Stand aside. Stand aside. Stand aside. Stop right there! Stop right there! Stop right there! Stop right there. Bly tries to grab sensitive documents before escaping, but the Corps have arrived too fast. He's trapped. The soldiers search the house and its outbuildings for two hours, and they can't find him. MacArthur stays outside with the citizens of Sydney and other leading businessmen like Gregory Blacksland and Simeon Lord. I guess it doesn't do to look too much in control. I've got a peep from his miserable eyes, sir. Damn the eyes! I will find him. Soldiers, back upstairs again! <sighs> The soldiers make one last search of the house. At first, it's as frustrating and unrewarding as before. But then, they retrace their steps. What's behind this door? That's my bedroom. There's nothing in there but my bed. Let's see. William Bly's reign as governor of New South Wales is about to come to an end. There it is! There it is! The governor is found! Yeah. Then, a moment when it could have gone horribly wrong. Mind yourselves, you might have a weapon! Come, sir! Put up your sword! I have no arms! Put up your sword! I will run you through! Keep the men off! I have no arms! Put down your sword, soldier! Put it down now! Let us withdraw, gentlemen. We found him there, sir. Underneath the bed. Come on. I will safely see you downstairs if you will allow me. Will you take my arm, sir? Thank you, Whaley. I'm perfectly safe with Mr. Minchin.
Whatever people think of bad-tempered Governor Bly, he puts on a gutsy performance when he's arrested by the Corps. But what feelings must consume him? Here it is, the dreadful business of mutiny, just like the bounty all those years ago. It's happening again. What have they done to you? Mary, it was from a girl. Have they hurt you? No. But you must let them go about their business without provoking them. I thought when they found you, they were... Mary, you must let me deal with these men in my own way. Major Johnson wishes to speak with you. This document purports to be a warrant issued by the men of property. The idea is to make the overthrow of Bly look legal. You are charged by the respectable inhabitants with crimes which render you unfit to exercise supreme authority in this colony for a moment longer. Signed, George Johnston, Acting Lieutenant Governor. Johnson calls himself Acting Lieutenant Governor because he wants to make it clear this is not a rebellion against London or the Crown. He knows that if back home they see this as treason, all these blokes could hang. The author of the document is John MacArthur. Well, you can see why he doesn't want to take the credit. Well, you're to be congratulated, Major, for the handsome manner in which you carried the wishes of the inhabitants into effect. Had I known I was so much disliked, I would have left the colony on the first available ship. Putting you under arrest by the advice of my officers. Oh. I therefore command that you submit to this arrest under which I'm placing you. Place a guard on all four corners of the house, outside in the grounds. No visitors for the governor unless they have prior permission. Sir, guards to your post. Remember, no visitors. Now the spin starts. Sergeant Whittle pays an artist to render in oils Bly being dragged from under the bed, the, the very image of a coward. And the rebels set the picture up in front of lanterns for all the world to see. And it doesn't matter that Bly could scarcely have fitted under that servant's bed. This picture becomes the image of the Rum Rebellion. And one of the most famous pieces of propaganda in Australian history, Bly's reputation never recovers. <laughs> The night after the coup, the town goes mad. People light bonfires and burn effigies of Bly. They roast lamb on a spit and drink themselves silly, cheering and toasting the leaders of the rebellion. Well, after all that, what happened? Surprisingly little, really. There'd been no revolution, no storming of the Bastille. The whole point had been to get rid of Bly. And with Bly and his daughter safely under house arrest, people just got back to their normal lives, with the Rum Corps and MacArthur pretty much back in control. But then a development that MacArthur hadn't counted on. A full year after the rebellion, Colonel Patterson comes back from Tasmania to assume command of the colony. This is Patterson of the Duel, and he hasn't forgotten the wounds that he received from MacArthur. He at least believes that something should be done. He packs Johnston off to London to face court-martial, and MacArthur follows, believing that he can influence events and pull a few strings. Having deposed a governor, these two men are now law-abiding citizens, ready to face their day in court. In 1810, a new governor arrives. He is Lieutenant Colonel Lachlan Macquarie. Bly is expecting to be reinstated as governor. Instead, he has been replaced. Why didn't they just give you a temporary commission? I committed no crime. It was not my decision. I answered the call, so to speak. But why revoke my commission? It's all calm now. Peace has been restored. I barely got started. I assume you intend to collect evidence for the court-martial. You, of course, must take all pains to present your case. I can assure you that's precisely what I'll do. I'll have them swinging by year's end. 
I have instructed the colonial secretary to make himself available to assist with the collection of all the appropriate documents. I've seen various members of the rebellion walking the streets. What's to be their fate? Much will depend on the outcome of the court martial. They deserve to be held in chains on a ship back home. For a dose of English justice. London, three years later, and the only trial of the Rum Rebellion finally gets underway. The army court-martials George Johnston for mutiny, a hanging offence. But Johnston is a sideshow. The man really on trial is Bly, desperate to justify his own behaviour as governor and expose John MacArthur as the man responsible. I would wish to ask this witness whether, in all the instances that may be deemed causes of the mutiny, there was any one instance where he was not concerned directly either as principal or party. I don't exactly understand the question. I conceive the arrest was occasioned by the dread that was entertained of the six officers being sent to jail and the resentment that would have been excited amongst the soldiers and the inhabitants, the dread of an insurrection. Such were my own motives. This is not what my question goes to, but to ascertain whether there were any other causes that produced the insurrection. None at all. Do not answer in haste. It seems that the first cause for grievance is the detention of that ship of yours and the forfeiture of 800 pounds. The next is about a post that was taken away from your ground and these seem to be the principal parts of all the causes of the revolution. Yes, well, those things I have no doubt caused great dissatisfaction, but I've never heard them assigned as reasons for the governor's arrest nor any other reasons assigned other than the dread of an insurrection. Were you not with the troops on the 26th of January? And did you not, as they marched up to Government House, give directions to several of the men and particularly the music? No, 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 I have no recollection of anything of the kind. Was not the paper signed by most of the officers and several other persons requesting Major Johnston to arrest the Governor in your handwriting? Yes, yes, it was. Where was it written and when? I was informed that Major Johnston had been earnestly urged to arrest the governor. I advised Major Johnston to get a written requisition. He acquiesced in it, and I then immediately wrote the paper alluded to. After 13 days of testimony... Major Johnston, please rise. It's time to end the story of the Rum Rebellion and decide the price to be paid for Australia's only military coup. The court, having duly and maturely weighed and considered the whole of the evidence adduced on the prosecution, as well as what has been offered in defence, are of the opinion that Major Johnston is guilty of the act of mutiny as described in the charge and do therefore sentence him to be cashiered. Which means they've sacked him from the army. Men found guilty of mutiny can find themselves dancing at the end of a rope, so the court's gone easy on Johnson. He's now free to go back to New South Wales and his wife and kids. Really, this verdict is a slap in the face for Bly, especially after he's worked so hard to nail MacArthur. A devastated Bly seeks comfort from his patron, Sir Joseph Banks. I oh, no doubt MacArthur used his influence with Lord Camden. And Johnston has friends in estimable places. The, the intrigues don't seem to trouble people these days. Oh, everyone knows poor Johnston was used. A surgical instrument dipped in rum. I'm told one of the judges was unable, through ill health, to attend on crucial days of judgment. He wanted nothing less than the full measure of the law to be meted out. Did they read out my declaration? Yes. I thought they should know some of the history before they start calling me a coward, hiding behind some damn bed. They need to know that I served with and was thanked personally by Lord Nelson I himself. know, I know. It was read. Did the court entertain any motive for the outrage performed on me and the colony? No, they deemed it to be some folly. Oh, it was no folly. 
We know why they did it. We all know why they did it. A few years later, Bly dies, a bitter man, his reputation forever tarnished as a tyrant and the governor who hid under the bed. And our man MacArthur, he too pays a price. MacArthur is forced to stay in London when the authorities threaten to put him on trial if he returns to New South Wales. It's eight years before he can return home to Elizabeth. They now have thousands of merinos and lead the way in an industry which will bring enormous prosperity to Australia, but commandeer vast amounts of Aboriginal land. MacArthur is not the man he was. In his later years, he'll go insane, but not before he's locked horns with yet another governor and left his indelible mark on the history of Australia. The Rum Rebellion is notable not for its violence, but for the fact that no one got hurt. In the absence of democracy, the people of Sydney had changed a government which had become unacceptable. It didn't usher in a new world order, but it does show that many of the people had started to care about government, ambition and justice. They may have come here as rogues, but they were starting to reinvent themselves as a nation. The man who would drive that process dramatically further was Bly's successor, Governor Lachlan Macquarie. Macquarie, more than anyone, saw the potential for Australia moving beyond its beginnings as a convict colony. Not just for the country, but for the convicts themselves. Macquarie wanted to give the prisoners a fresh start. He cleaned up Sydney and erected gracious buildings such as these. And he made friends and colleagues of many ex-convicts and set lots of them up with farms. Now, Macquarie was no saint. He was often vain and reckless with money. But he realised a great truth, that many of the ex-convicts and their children were no longer exiles. This had become their home. The convict settlement on the shores of Sydney Harbour is now three decades old. And in this place of exile, a great miracle is unfolding. The children are growing up taller, stronger, and more sober than their convict mums and dads. These boys and their sisters will soon be calling themselves Australian. Native youths, generally fair, blue eyes, tall, and developing a distinctive accent. <laughs> Bloody convicts! Seemingly free of the vices of their parents, but they do not seem to know their place. That bloke is Commissioner Big. Word has reached London that Governor Lachlan Macquarie has turned this prison into the convict's land of opportunity, and Big's been sent here to investigate. The people who really impress him are the exclusives. A small group who've come here as free settlers or officers and done well. People like the MacArthur's. So, uh, Mr Rudd, this is your prize marina. You are most welcome here, Mr Big. You must treat our small farm as your home away from home. Oh, it's a fine place. Ah, well, quality merino, quality merino, staring us in the face. Well, England shall never want for fine wool if we are given the resources here. Oh, well, this is good news. Now, nothing, this land, Mr Big, from nothing. Look left of that fool Macquarie. <laughs> It would return to nothing. Perhaps we should go inside. Well, I suspect that uh, Mr. Big is a man after my own heart. Mm? I believe I am, sir. Mm. Now, Macquarie has no respect for what we're doing here, the bloodlines that we've produced, nor the wealth that can be created for king and country if we are given more land and convict labour. Well, you're not the first to say so. I swear that man has given me gout. Mr. Big, would you like some lemonade? Thank you so much. You've seen the ships arriving, sir. Ten filled with convicts in the past few mm. months. And we don't see them. Now, Macquarie gets them for his government labour. No, the boy's right. Go this way, Mr. Big. Oh. Well, don't tell me an ex-convict can sit on a jury. They're not impartial. How can they be? They all want to bring respectable people down to their level. That is the convict's way. Lemonade, sir. Oh, thank you. Father feels the convicts have been less respectful under Governor Macquarie. Well, they're demanding their rights. What rights? Rights? 
This colony needs an aristocracy just to keep it stable. Men of capital, there is a dangerous democratic feeling taking root here. Nip it in the bud. Oh, now has that letter gone out to Wentworth? Yes, Papa. Yes, uh, private matter, a uh, marriage proposal. Rejected. Unsuitable. Convict stay. No. Yes, there's no, no, no need to write that down. Mr. Big likes what he hears. Australia is a wool exporting country run by prosperous exclusives. Just the thing to keep a decent Britain safe from radicals and Democrats. But bad news for the Aborigines. The original inhabitants, the Aborigines, are in crisis. They have lost their lands and have been decimated by smallpox. At sunset each day, Sydney Aborigines can be seen crossing the harbour in front of Government House to the North Shore to find thick trees or hollow logs where they spend the night. They still hunt and fish, but white man's bread and grog are winning out. As the colony progresses, their situation will only get worse. Ten thousand miles away, on the other side of the world in London, the colonial-born son of a convict, W.C. Wentworth, is studying law. Somehow, Wentworth has also found time to write a major book. It's a travel guide for migrants. It's also a savage attack on imperial rule in New South Wales. My sole aim, my only aim, my sole aim is to promote the welfare and prosperity of the country which gave me birth. In England, the old order of class and privilege is being challenged by radical Democrats like Tom Paine and Jeremy Bentham, who argues that the good society is based on the greatest happiness of the greatest number. Free representative governments are the only foundation on which the prosperity and happiness of communities can safely repose. Wentworth is not really a Democrat, but he is the son of a convict, and he reckons that his lot should have the same rights as any freeborn Englishman. So he's a huge supporter of the current governor, Lachlan Macquarie. And Macquarie is proud of what he's achieving. 265 projects built by convicts, some even designed by a convict. He's confident that Big's report will be, he says, highly honourable to my character. But Big has no time for Macquarie's good works. He wants the words New South Wales to strike terror into the hearts of criminals back home. And he condemns Macquarie's public works program as absurd. And it doesn't end there. Now, Your Excellency, you have a notion to appoint one Mr William Redfern to the bench of magistrates? I've given him my word he will be appointed. The appointment will give great offence. The man is one of our finest surgeons. If you appoint him to the magistracy, it might well be annulled. Put this in your notebook, sir. Write. Write. You've come here to write, so write. <laughs> As senior surgeon, Redfern initiated medical treatment for men on the convict gangs. His reports on our transport ships has transformed the way we do things here. He's worked tirelessly for the Aborigines Institution, the Benevolent Society. He's on the board of the bloody bank. He's a convict, which is why the Colonial Office would not appoint him Chief Surgeon, despite your recommendations. He's done his time. A convict cannot become a magistrate. There is no place for such a man within the law. Damn your narrow mind, sir. May I suggest, Your Excellency, that we continue our discussion at another time? Preferably in writing. Out there on those streets, there is industry and temperance. I have seen convicts rise to take their place alongside fellow citizens. And if you don't see any of that, sir, you really are a fool. Sir! In writing, Your Excellency, I think that will be best. Biggs's mostly negative report will be published by the time Macquarie returns home to England. He's devastated by its findings. Soon afterwards, he dies, a hero to his friends 
and supporters. To Governor Macquarie, who has raised to situations of the highest trust and dignity of many deserving persons who have been convicts. Wentworth knows what it is to be an outsider. His mother was a convict, and he's always wondered why his father, one of the wealthiest landowners, is shunned by Sydney society. He's about to find out. A pamphlet written by an English MP exposes his father's hidden past as a highway robber. This on top of John MacArthur's letter rejecting Wentworth's offer of marriage to his daughter Elizabeth. So, of course, Wentworth dreams of a colony where convicts and their children can aspire to greater things. As Wentworth sails home, he and the MacArthurs are now in rival camps. The MacArthurs will lead the exclusives, who believe that those tainted with convict blood have no place in polite society. Back in Sydney, Wentworth issues a rallying cry to the emancipists, the ex-convicts and their children. He is on a crusade to win self-government for all whites in the colony and to make his own mark on history. I will create for myself a reputation which shall reflect splendour on all who are related to me and remove the fangs of the MacArthurs from New South Wales. He's persuaded fellow barrister Robert Wardell to come back to Sydney and together the pair have set up a newspaper named defiantly The Australian. After a year, Wentworth relinquishes his share. From now on, his battleground will be the courts. One of his first cases, a young currency lass of no fortune, had been engaged to be married. Thank you, Mr. Wentworth. First witness, please. Her ex-fiance has not only ditched her for someone with a fortune, but started spreading scandal about her. You'd expect a 20-year-old woman of convict birth to hide herself away in shame, not Sarah Cox. A respectable girl, Your Honour, who has always kept good company, has never been out late at night. She is the first woman in New South Wales to sue a man for breach of promise of marriage, a suit that's usually brought in England by a posher type of gal. By the time Sarah gives evidence, she is three months pregnant to Wentworth, both Australian-born, both with convict associations. They set up house out there for all the world to see. Now the exclusives are really have it in for Wentworth. But he couldn't care less. He's determined to reform the colony. And now into this harbour of discontent sails Governor Sir Ralph Darling, formerly Governor of Mauritius and a man with a nose for seditious nonsense. Wentworth and the convict faction loathe him before he's even got off the boat. And six years later, he'll leave this place wondering what the hell went wrong. So what was this Sydney town like? By 1825, the European population of New South Wales has grown to around 36,000 people. Nearly half are migrants or emancipists. You'll find moneyed men of sale, trade and banking, convicts and sailors from around the globe. It's a place to reinvent yourself, make your fortune. Racing, boxing and drinking are the main sports, along with scandal and gossip. The crime rate here is actually no greater than that of London, and the punishments are no less severe. Lieutenant General Ralph Darling will be Australia's most conservative governor ever. Thanks to Commissioner Biggs' report, 
He's here to knock Sydney into shape. The Macquarie experiment is over. Well, we're not in Mauritius now, are we, Ralph? I suspect the convicts on that little island are going to seem like saints compared to this lot. <laughs> so, where do we start? Uh, reorganize the place. Public service is a mess. Their filing system is a disaster. Then I think perhaps a series of boards, a land boards, urgently needed. If you can find the caliber of officers to serve. Well, we found them in Mauritius. We'll find them here. And you, my dear. I'm told the servant class girls need a school, a residential school. I take it you're not asking me. I need to build it, train the teachers. I'll build it myself. I'm sure you will, my dear. I'm sure you will. With God's help. We're all going to need that. Mm. Oh. In a reform recommended by Mr Big, the British government sets up a legislative council. It's a small group of rich men and public servants who make laws for the colony. One of its members is John MacArthur Jr. and he takes up where his old man left off. I mean, we are a penal colony. New South Wales is not suited to the institutions of a free society. We know that there are those tainted with the convict stain, agitating for representation in this place, and to be allowed to sit on juries. It is our duty to resist this, to resist the radicals and the republicans, to resist the convict faction. So the battle lines are clear. What's more, Darling's been told that he will still make land grants to free settlers, but there'll be no more grants for ex-convicts. Wentworth rises to the fight. He wants a world in which the convict stain no longer exists. Macquarie's dream of building a fairer society cannot be abandoned. Wentworth embarks on a campaign of rowdy meetings and petitions back to England. The same rights for every British subject as the crown itself is the birthright of the king. Yeah. Through liberties. Yeah. Through the Australasian heart. The Australasian heart. Yeah. Now, no one with a convict taint is invited socially into Government House, but Darling makes sure he meets his potential enemies sooner rather than later. At this stage, Wentworth is still developing his strategy, but his fellow Australians want jobs and access to land, and they want to be free of the stigma attached to their birth. But Wentworth has more sweeping reforms in mind. He wants trial by jury, the right of emancipists to serve on juries, and he wants freedom of the press. Let's not kid ourselves. Wentworth's not some sort of equaliser. He's not going to lose any sleep if the needy get left behind. And as for the true native born, the Aborigines, he shows no interest in their rights at all. Mr. Wentworth. So you founded the uh, Australian newspaper, Mr. Wentworth? My colleague, Mr. Wardell, now runs the newspaper. Well, I must say it's a rather vigorous press. No pulling of punches. We enjoy our newspapers here. Interestingly, with less restrictions than in Great Britain itself. And we'd like to keep it that way. A colleague of mine warned me that a free press in the colony of New South Wales was rather akin to putting a printing press in Newgate Prison. <laughs> well, I see no reason to provoke any antagonism by introducing unnecessary restrictions, um, a license. Taxation, given that I've been treated very well by the press so far. Yes, well, that won't last. It's inevitable that the upright military man and the lover of wine and women will come to blows. And it's the case of two light-fingered privates that gives Wentworth the excuse to roll up his sleeves. <laughs> Private Suds and Private Thompson 
think they are nicking a piece of cloth. In fact, they are stealing a place in history. The unusual thing about these blokes is that they want to get caught. Regular soldiers get lousy pay to endure boredom, brutality and homesickness. And Suds and Thompson want a life. They reckon that convicts in the colony have it a whole lot easier. Assigned hours, agreed rates of pay, and when they've done their time, they can even apply for land grants. But times are changing. Governor Darling is determined to make an example of these two. He steps in and makes their punishment a whole lot tougher. Come on, come on. No! No, please, no. Francis Forbes is the first Chief Justice of New South Wales, a position recommended by Big, like a one-man high court. One of his jobs is to ensure that the laws made here are not repugnant to the laws of England. The sentence handed down was transportation to a secondary penal settlement for seven years. An example has to be set. Your Excellency might reconsider. No. Seven years hard labour in chains on the roads. Wentworth and his mates want to nail Darling as an autocrat. He's just played right into their hands. The iron chains are torture. The prisoners cannot stand or walk properly. And Suds is seriously ill. His stomach bloats, his arms and legs swell. He's taken to the prison hospital where the irons are removed. Five days later, he dies in agony. At first, the Monitor and the Sydney Gazette defend the governor. Suds was already ill, they say, and had failed to report it. And the chains were not as heavy as first thought. Even the Australian softens its tone. And the whole affair would just have been forgotten until W.C. Wentworth decides to stir it all up. It's one thing for the governor to relax a sentence, but to increase it? Unheard of. The governor has exceeded his powers. Impeach the savage bastard. Impeach him now. The Suds incident becomes Wentworth's war cry. It's trial by media, and it will entangle Darling for years. The correspondence with London heats up. The incident aroused a feeling of horror among all classes, except for the immediate dependence of Governor Darling. Wentworth threatens to have the case of Private Suds raised in the House of Commons and uses it to rally public support. Darling should be charged with murder! The colony's papers pick up the story and run with it. There was nothing irregular about those irons. You fitted the poor wretch with an iron collar. Oh, you're a civilian, Forbes. Lies. Seditious lies. Nepotism, abuse of power. They want land grants for currency lads now. Equal footing with the immigrants. Half the reporters are convicts. And your chum Wentworth is making these bullets. I know you'll drink with him. Don't try and deny it. Well, some might call it freedom of speech. Well, I call it sedition. And what do you imagine is the difference? Jail? Darling imprisons the editor of the Monitor newspaper as a warning to his critics. But E.S. Hall continues to produce his paper from jail. The colony's press refuses to be silenced. The death of Suds is proof of the existence within the Colonel, it's me, I assume, of a most wicked, depraved and malignant spirit. Dear God! Even the length of Darling's penis is fair game. Dear Sir, would to heaven that we knew the length of his member, for surely so much wisdom and magnanimity argue something superhuman. The tranquility of the colony must be preserved. The rift between these two is growing wider every day. Forbes is a liberal. He believes that all individuals have rights and protections under the rule of law. 
Darling believes that a liberal is just a radical with manners and that the colonials should do as they are damn well told. Perhaps the time is right to take up Lord Bathurst's suggestion. Issue licenses to the newspapers. Forfeited if the proprietor is found guilty of seditious libel or blasphemy. Serious stuff. Darling drafts the legislation, but he needs Forbes' support. After a couple of weeks' deliberation, Forbes decides that while the press might be licentious, any attempts to muzzle the papers would be, in effect, unconstitutional, that it would be repugnant to the laws of England. Damn! <laughs> to Chief Justice Forbes! Hey! To William Charles Wentworth! To the land, boys, we live in! To Australia! Australia! Hey! Australia! Around this time, W.C. Wentworth's father dies. This marks a new phase in Wentworth's attack on Darling. Now a rich man, he has nothing to lose. Or else he wants to honour the promise that he made to his father to reach society's summit. He deluges friends and power brokers in London with a 25,000 word attack on Darling, who reels under the assault. The chains used were instruments of torture. I urge you to file a bill of impeachment against Governor Darling for his crimes against humanity. The whole proceedings amounted to an attempt to cover up a misdeed that was tantamount to murder. In New South Wales, a hearing is called into the Suds and Thompson case. All right. Governor Darling is paralyzing the energies of this colony. The man is a monster. Oh, such a series of fraud and corruption as has never occurred before in the history of our colonial government. Suds and Thompson trial. Dear God, I wish I'd never heard their wretched names. It was not illegal. Well, we knew that. The governor altered the sentence before the men were transported. The size of the chains is governed neither by law nor usage. Oh. Governor Darling is exonerated in the death of Suds. Mud sticks, Eliza. Mud sticks. What Darling can't know is that he'll still be facing these charges a decade from now before the House of Commons, thanks largely to outrage generated by W.C. Wentworth. I do wonder, Ralph, if even an angel from heaven could get on in New South Wales. Only if the angel bet on horses and liked to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Darling wisely avoids the annual turf club dinner. He's got a suspicion about the quality of the guests. To Governor Macquarie, one of us. One of us! To the present governor. Darling comes down like a ton of bricks. He dismisses government officers associating with Wentworth or Waddell. He launches charges of sedition against the Australian. And he withdraws his membership of the Turf Club. The man is working 16 hours a day, and it's starting to show. In his own mind, he's given this place what it needed. Stern discipline and an orderly bureaucracy. And it's not as if this is the first place that he's been governor. But Sydney is different from Mauritius. It's complicated, messy, 
and tough, and it's populated by rogues of every description. Rogues who reckon that they have rights. Darling knows that his own career is in trouble unless he gets a good report card in England. Unfortunately for Darling, just a few blocks away, Jane New is strolling down George Street. She will be a thorn in Darling's side forevermore. Jane was transported to Tasmania for nicking cloth back in England. Life can be pretty brutal for female convicts, but Janie's done all right. Here's how it works. She's still serving out her sentence, but she's been assigned to her husband James as his servant. They've moved here to Sydney, where James has opened a pub and also deals in luxury items such as silk. What Jane does next will affect the rights of every settler in the colony. As you see, it is uh, very fine quality, huh? Beautiful, you let her get away, huh? Oh, you men, you are all the same. Jane New's past finally catches up with her. Eight months later, she's up on three counts of shoplifting. Madame Renz expects her charge to be added to the list. She wants to nail Jane for good but she hasn't reckoned on male hormones. John Stephen Jr. is a playboy. His father is the Liberal judge, John Stephen. His brother, Sidney, is Jane New's barrister. Because John comes from such a high-minded Liberal family, Governor Darling has appointed him a magistrate and registrar of the Supreme Court. He's also the magistrate who's hearing the charges today against Jane. You are convicted on three counts of shoplifting. The court extends the prisoner's original sentence by 12 months and allows the prisoner to return to the employ of her husband. He sent her back to her master, which means she's free to go home. No, no, this is not right. Ce n'est pas juste. What about my case against her? Excusez-moi. What are you going to do about this? And Madame Renz goes on arguing until three magistrates agree. Jane New will stand trial on the charge of stealing from Madame Renz's shop, and they refuse Jane bail. But the next thing you know, she's back on the street, thanks apparently to some paperwork done by John Stephen Jr. You thief! Who's, who's she talking to, I wonder? Thief! You are a thief! Oh, a thief, am I? A thief? Am I supposed to be scared? How do you get out of the jail, huh? How do you get let off the boat? That's what I'd like to know, garlic muncher. Just because you lost the war, Froggy. I will get you. Great. But Madame Renz is determined. She knows that nicking cloth worth more than two pounds is a very serious offence. She writes to the convict board and she hits the mark. Darling orders the police to imprison Jane to await trial. Six months later, Jane New's trial is playing to packed houses. The courts here are like theatres, full of stories of comedy and tragedy, and the spectators know that Jane New could be sentenced to hang by the neck. Oh, oui. C'est un morceau de tissu de... Madame Renz certainly knows her rights. She rejects the court interpreter and asks to use a friend. 
Yes, this is part of a piece of silk taken by the prisoner. Sure et certain. Definitely. C'est un motif unique, hein? It is a unique pattern. Sydney Stephen, Jane News barrister, calls a succession of supposed expert witnesses who flounder under cross-examination. In Hobart, I saw a great many silks in Jane News' possession. I remember a spearmint-coloured silk, about 20 yards. It had a leaf pattern, most definitely. I could swear to the pattern if I could see it. Yeah, this is it, exactly. There is no leaf pattern on this silk. It's the same. It's the same pattern. On my oath. In just a few days' time, John Wilson will join a host of men who petitioned Governor Darling to show leniency to Jane New. But now, the jury of military officers has reached its verdict. We find the defendant, Jane New, guilty. No! You were actuated by a lawless disposition with no possible inducement, but from indulgence in a course of predatory habits. Justice has at length overtaken you. For the prisoner Jane New, I order a sentence of death to be recorded. What? No! Death to be recorded indicates a willingness that she be reprieved. Had he sentenced her to death, then John Stephen Jr. would now be writing her death warrant. This leaves the door open for an appeal to the governor to show mercy and to commute the death sentence. John Stephen Jr. goes to work. He's completely besotted with Jane New and he fakes evidence to get her off. And he asks his chums from the big end of town to sign a petition calling on the government to review her sentence. Stephen gives the petition to Chief Justice Forbes for him to lay before the Executive Council. Magistrate Stevens has handed me a petition to commute the death sentence of Jane New. There is full support that the verdict is amply harsh. A person who wantonly plunges into vice, indulges in evil propensities, relinquishes every claim to indulgence. I am prepared to commute the death sentence and impose a sentence of 14 years hard labour in Moreton Bay on our Mrs New. 14 years at the penal settlement of Moreton Bay. A sentence almost as bad as death. But Jane New is in luck. Your Excellency, there's a serious anomaly here. We need to look back at when the crime was committed. We tend to imagine that the convicts were subject to cruel and arbitrary punishment. And at places like Moreton Bay, that's certainly true. But this is a system which is taking meticulous care of Jane New's rights, even though she's a repeat offender. And she's just found a new ally. Chief Justice Forbes has discovered a cock-up. Before Jane was tried, the British government amended the law under which she's been convicted. But Darling, burdened with overwork, failed to make the change, even though Forbes advised him to. Open the door. Let them out. God, give me strength. The legal loophole means that those prisoners convicted under the obsolete law will have to be released. All the prisoners except Jane New Darling is incensed and is determined to make an example of this convict upstart. The governor has to let me out. Mr. Stevens says he ain't got no choice. I'm innocent. You're not that innocent. Legally, and that's what counts. 
the governor uses his executive powers to dissolve the cosy assignment arrangement between Jim and Jane New. I bought us a transfer you to the female factory. Come along now. No! 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 Jane, get gone! Gone! Get gone! No! No! Darling's zest for discipline and order will come back to haunt him, just as it did when he blundered into the Suds and Thompson case. By declaring Jane to be a convict at large and then confining her to the notorious female factory, he's deprived James New of his servant. So now the question is this. What are James New's rights? The governor retains all rights over the assignment of convicts. According to the Act, you can show mercy. You can't just blaze in and make the sentence more severe. And what of Mr New? The husband? What of him? Well, the colony can't run without assigned servants. Uh, you've robbed him of his property rights in her. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Isn't it? He just doesn't get it. The age of the all-powerful governor is over. Forbes speaks for a new age of rights and the rule of law. And once this dawns on Darling, he must know what's coming. Or rather, who's coming. Wentworth, with the help of the Stephen brothers, issues a writ of habeas corpus, alleging the false imprisonment of Jane New. Now, this turns on a vital political question. How far can the government interfere with a person's property rights? You see, Jane New, as an assigned convict, is the property of her husband, James. Can the governor rightly deprive this man? Deprive him of his servant? The governor has no power to interfere in the assignment of a convict. But the governor has consigned this woman, a woman who should never have been brought to trial, to the hellhole of the female factory, contrary to the most fundamental principles of British justice. Wentworth at this stage probably feels that victory is in his grasp. After days of deliberation, here's the Chief Justice back with the court's decision. In my opinion, the governor has the power to cancel the assignment of a convict servant only for the purpose of improving a convict's lot. But Jane New was transported to Tasmania, not to New South Wales. She had no right to follow her husband to the colony of New South Wales until her sentence had expired or been remitted. We feel ourselves bound to order that she be placed in jail and returned to Tasmania, the place of her original sentence. Bad news for Jane New, but a great victory for the local colonists. A legal precedent has just been set, limiting the governor's powers. This is ridiculous. How it can be remedied without the intervention of parliament, I really do not know. A woman lusts after a piece of cloth. A constitutional crisis is in the making. It's absurd. Darling sends an appeal to London. A long, slow process that will take 15 months for a reply. Finally, in the winter of 1830, the dispatches on Chief Justice Forbes' decision arrive. England orders Darling and Forbes to stop bickering. Then, a surprise. London questions the legality of Forbes's ruling on the limits of the governor's power. Darling feels vindicated and let's fly. What's this? Governor orders, sir. I need to remove these convicts. Governor's orders? Yes, sir. This is a joke! In retaliation for the dreadful press he's received, Darling withdraws the convicts assigned to the Australian and the Monitor, most of whom are reporters. And foolishly, he writes home boasting about it. This time, he's gone too far. His bosses in London wrap him over the knuckles. He is never again to use his power to silence his critics. 
Wentworth joins John Stephen Jr. for a drink to celebrate Darling's comeuppance. But Stephen is much more interested in love than law. Jane New is still locked up, awaiting transport back to Tasmania. But thanks to John Stephen Jr, not for long. John Stephen rents a pokey little room from a family living in an isolated cottage. He tells them the sad story that their tenant is Mrs Dixon, the victim of a violent marriage, and he's just looking out for her welfare. But it's a small community, and Jane is a celebrity. It's not long before tongues start to wag. just found two tickets of leave. Now, this is an official government document that gives a convict the freedom of the colony. One's for Mrs New, and the other is for her alter ego, Mrs Dixon. And they're both signed by the Registrar of the Court, John Stephen, Jr. Knowing that Stephen drinks with Wentworth, Darling is careful not to inflame him. He hopes that Stephen will resign like a gentleman and go back home to England. They are forgeries, Your Excellency. Yours, sir. They're not mine. Other letters granting Jane New leave to stay at home during her trial. And these letters, sir, in your hand. Governor Darling is soon to be recalled. Soon to be recalled! A mischief maker, sir. But not myself. Darling suspends Stephen from office not wanting to reveal that one of their own has breached a law. Another decision he'll live to regret. <laughs> Perhaps the romance of John Stephen and Jane New inspires Wentworth. With three young children and another one on the way, the man who once dreamed of joining his name to the MacArthurs marries the convict, Sarah Cox. But scandal and gossip are infectious. In about 12 months' time, Wentworth's mistress, Jemima, will also bear him a child. <laughs> Speaking of infectious... Let no man come here. I have influenza. Oh, no, he doesn't. What he does have is a convict on the run. For the past three weeks, the Wentworths have been hiding Jane New. Pretty risky business for a barrister. And then one night... A short time later, John Stephen sailed for London, where he made sure the papers vilified Darling as the monster who'd murdered Private Suds. A year later, Darling is told by his superiors that his term will not be renewed. Back in England, he will face tough questioning from the reformers who are now in power. Under his governorship, 
there were more convict executions and severe punishments than at any other time in the history of the colony. His reputation will never recover. For Darling's departure, an open house party was held by a victorious Wentworth. Free food and grog for all! This land, lads, we live in. Good riddance and damnation to the defective autocratic rat of a man who came here to stamp on liberty and grind her into the soil. And we colonists have an equality of rights and privileges with the king's subjects in the old country. As Governor Darling and his family sailed back to England, passing by just about here, the mob gave him an Australian farewell. He must have left wondering what he'd done to deserve six years of New South Wales. Wentworth continued to fight tooth and nail for colonial self-government. But he was never a full-blooded Democrat. He never wanted a system in which the common labourer had an equal vote with the man of property. But that's exactly what happened. 25 years later, the first democratically elected parliament. And the delicious irony is that the old rogue helped to pave the way. As for that cunning little thief Jane knew, she slipped out of history. And she got away because white Australia was developing a robust system of rights. It was becoming a full-blooded society. Some gossips reckon she made it back to London, and I like to think that she did. Sure, she was a rogue, but she was a rogue who helped to make Australia a nation.